Jaya Gopi Jana Bala Bha Giri Varadhari Jaya Gopi Jana Bala Bha Giri Varadhari Jaya Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada, Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada. Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Today is Tuesday, July 11th, 2023, and we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, The Cosmic Manifestation, Chapter 4, The Process of Creation. Um, we're going to be reading texts 11 through 17 with a focus on text 12, so I'll give you this time to pull it up on your devices if you have any. Um, so that's ch Canto 2, Chapter 4, Text 12. Omagyana Timrandasya Jana Jana Shalakaya Chakshuru Mitam Jena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha. I was born in the darkest of ignorance, and my spiritual master opened my eyes with the torch of knowledge. I offer my respectful obeisances unto him. Shri Chaitanya Manovistam Sapitam Jana Butale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadati Swapadantikam. When will Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada, who was established within this material world, the mission to fulfill the desire of Lord Chaitanya give me shelter under his lotus feet. Vancha kalpa tarubhyascha kripa sinubhyavasha patita nam pavanebhyo vaishnavebhyo namonamaha. 
I offer my respectful obeisances unto the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord. They are just like desire trees and can fulfill the desires of everyone, and they are full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda. I offer my respectful obeisances unto Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Lord Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar Pandit, Sri Vas Thakur, and all the devotees of Lord Chaitanya. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. I pray that Sri Sri Radha Kalachanji, Srila Prabhupada, and Srila Gurudev use me as an instrument so that their words can flow through me to give me the um, message to serve the Vaishnavas listening. So as I said, we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 2, The Cosmic Manifestation, Chapter 4, The Process of Creation, Text 12. Um, for those of you who have your devices, do you have it pulled up already? Okay. So please repeat. Shri Sukha Uvacha Nama Parasmai Purusha Bhuyase Sadhu Bhava Stana Nirodha Lilaya Krihata Shakti Trataya Dehinam Antar Bhavya Nu Palakshya Vartmane Please chant. Shri Sukha Uvacha Nama Parasmai Purusha Bhuyase Sadubhava Stana Nirodhalaya Kriyata Shakti Tritaya Dehinam Antar Bhavaya Palakshaya Vartmane Would you like to chant? Shri Sukha Uvacha Nama Parasmai Purushaya Puyase Sad Udhavastana Nirodhya Lilae Krihita Shakti Tritaye Dehinam Antar Bhavaya Nulak Prashet Vartmanaya Shri Sukha Uvacha Shri Sukha Dev Goswami said Nama Offering obeisances, Parasmai, the Supreme, Purusaya, the Personality of Godhead, Bhuyase, unto the Complete Whole, Sadhubhava, the Creation of the Material World, Stana, its Maintenance, Nirodha, and it's winding up, Lilaya, by the pastime of Rihita, having accepted Shakti, power, Tritaya, three modes, Dehinam, of all who possess material bodies, Antaha, Bhavaya, Unto he who resides within, Anupalakshya, inconceivable, Vartmane, one who has such ways. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Sukadev Goswami said, Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who, for the creation of the material world, accepts the three modes of nature. He is the complete whole residing within the body of everyone, and his ways are inconceivable. Purport. This material world is a manifestation of the three modes, goodness, passion, and ignorance. And the Supreme Lord, 
for the creation, maintenance, and destruction of the world, he accepts three predominating forms as Brahma, Vishnu, and Sankara, Shiva. As Vishnu, he enters into every body materially created, and as Garbhadakshai Vishnu, he enters into every universe. As Shiradakshai Vishnu, he enters the body of every living being. Lord Sri Krishna, being the origin of all Vishnu Tattvas, is addressed here as Parapuman, or Purushottama, as described in the Bhagavad Gita 1518. I'm just going to read that really quick. Because I am transcendental beyond both the fallible and infallible, and because I am the greatest, I am celebrated both in the world and in the Vedas as that supreme person. He is the complete whole. The Purusha avatars are therefore his plenary expansions. Bhakti Yoga is the only process by which one can become competent to know him. Because the empiric philosophies and mystic yogis cannot conceive of the personality of Godhead, he is called Anupalakshya Vartmane, the Lord of the Inconceivable Way, or Bhakti Yoga. So I'm going to go back and read text 11 through 17, and then we'll start class. Sutta Goswami said, When Sukadev Goswami was thus requested by the king to describe the creative energy of the personality of Godhead, he then systematically remembered senses, Sri Krishna, and to reply properly, he spoke thus. Sukadev Goswami said, Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who, for the creation of the material world, accepts the three modes of nature. He is the complete whole residing within the body of everyone, and his ways are inconceivable. I again offer my respectful obeisances unto the form of complete existence and transcendence, who is the liberator of the pious devotees from all distresses and the destroyer of the further advances in atheistic temperament of non-devotee demons. For the transcendentalists who are situated in the topmost spiritual perfection, he grants their specific destinations. Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto him who is the associate of the members of the Yadu dynasty and who is always a problem for the non-devotees. He is the supreme enjoyer of both the, both the material and spiritual worlds, yet he enjoys his own abode in the spiritual sky. There is no one equal to him because his transcendental opulence is immeasurable. Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the all-auspicious Lord Sri Krishna, about whom glorification, remembrances, audience, prayers, hearing, and worship can at once cleanse the effects of all sins of the performer. Let me offer my respectful obeisances again and again unto the all-auspicious Lord Sri Krishna, the highly intellectual, simply by surrendering unto his lotus feet, are relieved of all attachments to present and future existences, and without difficulty progress toward the spiritual existence. Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the all-auspicious Lord Sri Krishna again and again, because the great learned sages, the great performers of charity, the great workers of distinction, the great philosophers and mystics, the great chanters of the Vedic hymns, and the great followers of Vedic principles cannot achieve any fruitful result without dedication of such great qualities to the service of the Lord. So Sukadev Goswami is describing Krishna's glories in response to Maharaj Parikshit's questions that we just went through. So just as a quick reminder, Maharaj Parikshit asks questions about how Krishna creates the universe. He asks how he uses his energies to maintain the world. He asks him about his inconceivable activities and his expansions. So Sukadev Goswami's first response is that he creates the material world. He accepts the three modes of nature, and he is completely whole, residing in everyone. And this is inconceivable. Right? We just can't conceive this. So we know that Krishna is the ultimate source. He's the creator. He's, um, he's the original creator. Right. So in um, Purport 11, Prabhupada quotes Bhagavad Gita 15.15, which says, I am seated in everyone's heart. And from me come remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. By all the Vedas, I am to be known. Indeed, I am the compiler of Vedanta, and I am the knower of the Vedas. So, 
Krishna confirms that he's saying that he's in everyone's heart. And Prabhupada, in today's purport, he describes that. He says Krishna first expands himself into one of his plenary expansions, right? He expands into Karanadaki Shai Vishnu, who's also known as Mahavishnu. And he creates the Mahatattva, which is the material sky. Um, and then from his pores, as you know, he's breathing in and out, universes are created. And in each and every one of those universes, Krishna enters as Garbhadakashayi Vishnu. And from whose navel Brahma is born, right? So we know um, Brahma is born from Vishnu's navel, but this is the specific Vishnu, is Garbhadakashayi Vishnu, which means that every single universe has a Garbhadakashayi Vishnu and a Brahma. Um, and then Brahma uses you know, he's taught and then he creates, that's his job, he creates the entire world. And every single living being that gets created, Krishir Dakashai Vishnu, also known as Paramatma, enters into the heart of every, everything, every living thing, you know, like, or non-living thing. So every atom of Paramatma enters. So we get an idea of the vastness of, you know, the world of the universe, not just who we are. Um, and last time we talked about, you know, that, um, how vast the universe is, right? And I wanted to go ahead and quote from Servant of the Servant, that, par that um, interaction between Prabhupada and Tamal Krishna Goswami, in which Prabhupada is um, talking about creation. And he says, this is in chapter 3, page 85 of the Servant of the Servant. Prabhupada began to explain the plan of the creation. First, he pointed to where Krishna was and described how the entire creation was an extension of Krishna's energy. The Vaikuntha planets, broad and effulgent, were unlimited in number. Then Prabhupada pointed to the corner of the painting where the material world was situated. Mahavishnu is lying down there, and millions of universes emanate from his skin holes. Prabhupada said, each universe is filled up with unlimited numbers of living entities who inhabit all of the planets and stars. One of these planets is our Earth, and on this planet are many continents. On one continent there is America, and in America there are so many big cities. Here is Los Angeles, and in Los Angeles there is a street, La Cienega Boulevard. On this boulevard, among all the buildings, is a temple of the Lord Krishna. Krishna. In this temple, there is one Tamal Krishna, and he is there and is thinking that he is very important. So when we look at the vastness of the universe, we get an, an idea that, you know, we put a lot of self-importance on ourselves, right? Like we think, well, we are the center of our own universes, but we think we are the center of everyone's universes, and we, if we aren't, we should be. Um, so, you know, we get this idea of vastness. Now, we talked about how some people can hear and read and see something like this about the vastness of the, of the universe, and they think, well, you know, this proves that there is no God, because look how vast everything is. And it's all, you know, created, it, or it's just going on, and it doesn't need a creator. And then we, some of us look at this and we think, wow, you know, this has to have a creator, because look how um, everything is flowing. And then when we look at this and we feel, you know, our insignificance, sometimes that can cause, like, this feeling of, like, does anything I do even matter, right? Does anyone ever feel like that sometimes when you start thinking about how vast the universe is, right? Does anything I do even matter? And at the same time, we have, you know, there's all these on Earth itself, there's 8 billion humans, and then there's so many more of all the other species, right? So there's like, I don't even know how many species and living entities we have here on Earth alone. And then we have all these vast universes. And I think of that, and I think, and yet, I have a very unique and personal relationship with God, as does every single living entity all across the universes. We all have our special, unique relationship. And this is the glory, the inconceivable um, 
strength and opulence of Krishna is that there can be billions and billions and billions of living entities, and he has a personal relationship with each and every one of us. So we can, on the one hand, feel insignificant, or we can feel gratitude that amongst all this vastness, we are still not forgotten. We are still very much taken care of and provided shelter by Krishna, by God, by the fact that we have come across Prabhupada's teachings and the devotees, right? So it, it kind of, you know, it's, we have to realize that we are one of many, but that we also have a unique relationship. So we, when we realize we're one of many, we don't, you know, we can not give ourselves the self-importance that Prabhupada is here, you know, kind of jokingly chastising Tamal Krishna Goswami about, because um, we all do that sometimes, right? We forget about the vastness of the universe. But at the same time, we don't want to get um, lost in the vastness, right? There's so many times where I know that sometimes, like, I'll come to a gathering and sometimes you just want to shrink into the wall so nobody notices you, nobody talks to you, nobody, right? Because you want to feel lost. Sometimes it's comfortable to feel that lostness. And then other times you want to talk to people and you want to be known and you want to, you know, you want to um, have that association. And that's when we feel that each individual can make a difference. And a lot of times that's where we want to be is that despite this vastness, what we do matters. So Sukadev Goswami continues and he says um, that Krishna is the form of complete existence and transcendence. He's the liberator of the pious devotees. He's the, non, he's the destroyer of non-devotee demons, especially their teachings. He grants the specific destinations devotees on the path of spiritual perfection. So um, he also says that they're a problem for non-devotees, that, that Krishna is a problem for non-devotees, and that he's a supreme enjoyer and has no equal. In the purport of text 13, Prabhupada quotes um, Bhagavad Gita 4.11, and he says, As all surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects. So he's saying that when we desire to go, <clears throat> whatever we desire, Krishna will fulfill in one form or another. Either he will fulfill it directly or he'll have, you know, one of his demigods, one of his cabinet members, right, fulfill it um, for us. But whatever we do, whether we're praying to Krishna, we're praying to Shiva, it's all indirectly praying to Krishna. And that's what he's saying. Like, wherever, however we surrender ourselves, that's how he's going to reward us and, and, re and reciprocate with us. He, in Purport 14, um, Prabhupada quotes Bhagavad Gita 15.6, and he says, That supreme abode of mine is not illumined by the sun or moon, nor by fire or electricity. Those who reach it never return to this material world. He also goes on to quote the Shopanishad, O oh Lord, you are the maintainer of everything, both material and spiritual, and everything flourishes by your mercy. Your devotional service of bhakti yoga is the actual principle of religion, satya dharma, and I am engaged in that service. Kindly protect me by showing your real face. Please, therefore, remove the veil of your Brahma Jyoti rays so that I can see your form of eternal bliss and knowledge. So again, this is confirming that Krishna creates everything. He's the original creator. You know, he's the creator of creation. Um, and that the way we can learn about him is through bhakti yoga, is through devotional service, um, and in this principle of Krishna consciousness, right? So the Goswami that says, glorification, remembrances, audience, prayers, hearing, and worship of Krishna can at once cleanse the effects of all sins of the performer. Um, so he's glorifying bhakti yoga, right? Because this is the nine processes of devotional service. Um, 
Does anybody want to share what the nine processes of devotional service are? Or whichever ones you remember at the moment? I can give you a hint. Hearing. Correct. So it's hearing, chanting, remembering, serving Krishna, worshiping him in deity <clears throat> service, offering prayers, becoming Krishna's servant, becoming his friend, um, and surrendering everything to him. So we learn um, that doing so can cleanse the effects of all sins of the performer. And when I was reading that, it reminded me of the verses of the Shikshastikam, right? So the first um, verse and a half, it says that when we chant, when we engage in these nine pr processes, devotional services, it cleanses the heart of all the dust accumulated for years. It extinguishes the fire of conditional life, of repeated birth and death. It's the prime benediction for humanity at large. It sprays, spreads the rays of the benediction moon. It's the life of all transcendental knowledge. It increases the ocean of transcendental bliss. It enables us to fully taste the nectar for which we are always anxious and can render all benediction to living beings. So then Sukadeva Goswami continues, surrendering unto his lotus feet relieves one of all attachments um, to present and future existences. And when we surrender, we can progress towards our spiritual existence without difficulty. Um, and then Prabhupada quotes Bhagavad Gita 1864 to 66 in the purport of um, verse 16. He says, My dear Arjuna, you are very dear to me, and therefore only for your good I will disclose the most secret part of my instructions. It is simply this. Become a pure devotee of mine. Give yourself unto me only, and I promise you full spiritual existence by which you may gain the eternal right of transcendental loving service unto me. Just give up all other ways of religiosity and exclusively surrender unto me and believe that I will protect you from your sinful acts and I shall deliver you. Do not worry anymore. Prabhupada goes on to quote Srimad Bhagavatam 10, 14, 14, where it says, My dear Lord, these are the prayers from Brahma to Krishna. Devotional service unto you is the best path for self-realization. If someone gives up that path and engages in the cultivation of speculative knowledge, they will simply undergo a troublesome process and will not achieve their desired result. As a person who beats an empty husk of wheat cannot get grain, one who simply speculates cannot achieve self-realization. Their only gain is trouble. And then <clears throat> Sugadev Goswami uh, continues and says, one cannot achieve any fruitful result without dedication of such great qualities to the service of the Lord. And this includes great learned sages, the great performers of charity, the great workers, the great philosophers and mystics, the great chanters of Vedic hymns, and the great followers of Vedic principles doesn't matter how m people how much people learn how intelligent they are what kind of work they do you know that they're great chanters they you know pronounce the Shiva Bhagavatam perfectly and um, they're following all that Vedic principles if they don't dedicate themselves to serving Lord Krishna it doesn't really matter they're not really going to achieve fruitful results and then um, we conclude with Bhagavad Gita 927, and, um, whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer or give away, and whatever austerities you perform, do that 
as an offering to me. So these verses are basically, they're touting Krishna's glories, but they're saying we can only understand these glories if we pick up the process of devotional service so that we know who we are in relation to Krishna. Because when we don't, we can feel this lost um, feeling of, you know, being insignificant, of being the one of many and, and feeling like nothing matters. But when we connect ourselves to Krishna and we really start to um, discover our personal relationship with Krishna, then, you know, we don't feel so lost anymore. We don't feel this despair, this lack of hope, this, you know, that feeling of insignificance. And we discussed that the nine processes of devotional service is how we get there. And we have a few activities that we do that we can engage in to help us. Um, does anyone want to share some of those activities that we can do to help us engage in these nine processes of devotional service to help us learn who we are? So how would you engage your senses? No, but how would you? How would you engage your senses? So um, the response here is we can use our feet to walk to the temple. We can use our eyes to see the devotees. We can use our arms to embrace other devotees. Um, we use our eyes to see the deities. I'm sorry. Um, and, you know, we can use our tongue to taste prasadam, to eat prasadam. I don't remember what else he said. We use our nose to uh, smell incense offered to Krishna. Any other ways we can engage our senses? So the story shared here is that during Kirtan this morning, during Guru Puja, there was a bug um, right you know, on the floor, and his daughter pointed it out, and he was thinking, oh, should I take the bug out, and you know, because it could disturb. But then he also thought, well, no, this bug is soaking in the transcendental vibrations of the Kirtan, and is in the pre presence of Radha Kalachanji, and you know, that's basically surrendering. You know, this bug is kind of surrendering in this moment. And so, um, you know, we can see that, like, every soul has that relationship, right? So um, some of the activities that we can do also that can help us discover who we are is reading Srimad Bhagavatam, reading Bhagavad Gita, reading 
Chaitanya Charita Amrita, reading these books, we associate with each other, right? We honor prasadam. We um, talk about Krishna to others, uh, whether they're already devotees or not devotees. Um, and I would probably propose the most important activity that we do. What do you think that is? Chanting our japa. It's the most important activity that we do. When we formally take up this process of Krishna consciousness, we make certain vows. We, you know, say that we're not going to eat meat, fish, and eggs to honor the principle of mercy. We say that we're not going to do gambling to honor truthfulness. We say that we're not going to engage in illicit sexual activity uh, to honor um, cleanliness. And then we're not going to intoxication to honor austerity. But the one thing that we say we are going to do is chant japa. And this is so important because this is our personal time with Krishna. This is how we realize that we have this personal relationship. This is how we don't feel insignificant in this vast creation is by chanting japa. We connect ourselves to him. And we want to try to do it with full attention. It's not always easy. It doesn't happen every day. Um, but when it does, it feels really good, right? We, we feel there's an intensity that can feel really good, and there's also an intensity that can be very tough because we can also be faced with all the things we don't want to face about ourselves when we chant japa. Um, but also, when we learn to chant japa in such a way that we surrender all of these flaws and faults that we have, the fact that we know about this um, process and sometimes don't engage in it, right? We can feel guilty. We can feel shame. We can feel so many things because we don't always follow the orders of our spiritual master. We don't always chant attentive rounds. We don't always engage in reading or associating. Um, but in that moment, if we're fully surrendering to Krishna, we can surrender all of those flaws to him as well. And he takes all of that. He accepts us despite our flaws. We don't have to be perfect. And this is the, chant, the power of chanting Hare Krishna. I'm going to go on and quote the Shiksastika and finish up with verse 2 and 3. It says that the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is invested with all of Krishna's transcendental energies. There's not even hard and fast rules for chanting these names, which means that we don't have to, you know, we don't have to do anything. We could just chant wherever we are at any time. We don't have to have our beads in hand. We can have our beads in hand. It helps us to focus our senses. Um, but sometimes, you know, if you're waiting in line somewhere or, you know, whatever is happening, you may not have your beads with you. You can still chant. There's no hard and fast rules. Krishna enables us to easily approach his name, him by his holy name, right? So just by chanting, we're actually spending time with Krishna. No different than if you're sitting with a friend and chatting with them. It's the same thing when we're cha chanting our rounds. Anytime we chant Hare Krishna, Krishna is here with us, right? So we're never alone. And it's not just Krishna, it's Radha Krishna, right? It's the divine couple and their entire entourage. So we're never alone. We're never meant to feel this insignificance, right? Because Krishna makes each and every one of us feel important. If we look at the picture of the um, Rasa dance, you can see that each and every one of the gopis felt that Krishna was with them only, right? He expanded himself. So he does that with us. He makes us feel, and he is, not just he makes us feel, he is with each and, uh, one of, each and every one of us at every moment, no matter how many of us there are. Krishna is present in his name. He's non-different. And so we want to chant this japa in this mood of gratitude, right? So we continue on. Um, we also want to chant in a humble state. Um, thinking oneself lower than the straw in the street, more tolerant than a tree, and devoid of all sense of false prestige, ready to offer all respect to others. So we chant in this mood of 
Krishna, please engage me in your service. Take away any entanglements which would lead me to stray from your service and leave any that would help me engage further. And this is our mood when we chant, right? We recognize that Krishna is with us, fully present at every single time. And unlike our friends, right? Like if, if I invite you over and we're hanging out and I get on my phone and I start scrolling Facebook and I do that every single time you come over, eventually you're going to stop coming over. But Krishna is so merciful that he never stops coming over, no matter how inattentively or um, offensively we may chant. We don't want to do that, right? Because we want to, to engage in that relationship, to feel Krishna's presence, and we can only feel his presence if we chant attentively. So we want to have that goal. I would say, you know, one thing that we can do is, even if you're chanting 16 rounds, and it could be, However, I know that sometimes the quantity becomes more important than the quality, uh, you know. Some days it's about, I need to just get those 16 rounds done. And some days it's like, no, I want to, it's not about getting it done, it's about engaging in it. And um, you can start small. You can start with like one mantra, you know, focus one at a time. Because we don't chant 16 rounds or 1,728 names, we chant one name at one time, right? So focus on the mantra that we're already chanting, that we're chanting at the moment. Um, you can start doing that with, you know, we're going to go through one whole round, 108 mantras, and focus on each and every one of them, right? And then, you know, the rest of the 15, or however many that you've taken a promise to, to chant, um, However, and then slowly to build up on that, because chanting attentively is a muscle like any other muscle, right? If you're going to go lift weights, you can't just start with 100 pounds. You have to start small and then slowly work your way up. The same thing when we chant, you know, there are a few people that can go and lift 100 pounds immediately with no damage, but majority of the people, right, there are a few people that can chant fully attentively, you know, 16 japa rounds but most of us it takes practice it takes getting there so we can gradually move you know to two rounds and you can set like a time frame like okay for the next week i'm going to chant two rounds fully attentively and then increase from there right and keep setting goals like that for yourself so i'll stop here and see if anyone has any questions comments realizations that you want to share yes
great. Yeah, that's a great comment. Um, the comment is that in the last um, sentence of the purport today, that Prabhupada says that um, he's, Krishna is the Lord of the inconceivable way. And the only way we can understand him is by bhakti yoga. So these um, scientists and philosophers, they, you know, they have all this speculative knowledge and they can't even begin to conceive the vastness of Krishna's glories. And, you know, there's, um, as I guess in India, there's, and especially I think all over, the, the space um, interest has picked up again. Right, we did it in the 60s, went to the moon, and then like nothing happened. Nobody cared anymore about space. And now there's like expeditions to Mars and the moon, and like we have these billionaires that are, you know, creating rockets and launching themselves into space. Um, and not just space, like the ocean, right? It was this like recently the. Um, like three or four really millionaires or something that like imploded in this submarine that was trying to explore the Titanic remains. And, you know, so it's like we have this quest for knowledge, right? And because not everyone has this um, exposure to Krishna consciousness, to bhakti, they try to quest this knowledge in so many different ways. Like, oh, this universe and like you said they're going to the moon but there's billions of galaxies and they can't even think further than the moon or mars or this particular galaxy right and um or you know even the ocean there's so much to explore and yet they want to explore where the ships you know sank um but this comes from our nature of being full of knowledge this is our eternal nature Right, and so we try to tap into this knowledge base by exploring these things without realizing true knowledge comes from reconnecting to God. Um, and so that's where, you know, bhakti yoga is the process. You, we can do speculative knowledge, we can jnana yoga, we can do, you know, all these other types of um, under trying to understand God, but it's through devotional service only, right? That when we surrender ourselves and we serve Krishna in a loving way, that we can understand who Krishna is and the vastness of the universe and everything that he entails. Um, all right, so I'll stop here because it's already 8.30. Dharantara Srimad Bhagavatam ki.